Welcome to the third part of our heritage talk on the Berlin airlift 10 tons for Tempelhof, discovering the start of the Berlin blockade. On the 24th of June, the same day the Ostmark was produced or, or, or was placed in circulation, technical restrictions re raised their head once again. Those had been tested out in uh, in April, but now they were physically there. As you can see, there's a railway line with a big dump of uh, muck over the top of it that would certainly stop a train but what stopped it even what stopped rail travel even more so was the fact that if you took a railway line up that was the end of that uh, so quite a number of the railway lines were just stripped of long lengths uh, to, to stop traffic getting in uh, border controls were the same you know there was no way of getting um, no way of getting transport in now and the canals all had uh, obstacles so in them and waterways and such like meaning it was very well it was impassable uh, for water uh, water transport as well and so the berlin airlift had to start this was the blockade this was the actual blockade of berlin now well um general lucius clay there he is um noted uh he was he was the head of the the uh, commandature as it was and certainly the allied forces within berlin uh noted as we can say there that we're not going to leave you know uh we, we have to, a right to be here and we're going to stay we are not going to be forced out by the soviets uh that was a bold statement considering they were marooned uh quite a distance inside a, an unfriendly country privations in the uh in the in the city itself uh were, were quite severe uh young lady in a bath there nothing implied but you can see um you can see the light that she has the gas light uh, the the oil light sorry with the mirror behind it to produce more uh, to more light in the bath the restrictions were such that there was only electricity for so uh so many hours a day um in fact interestingly some some of the wives because by then some of the wives certainly of the american servicemen uh were also living in this occupied city with with their husbands um, and there is talk of uh, moving a roast dinner around three or four houses as the electricity went off in one area and came on in, in another to get the roast cooked so I can imagine what that was like by the time they got sat down to eat it but of course not everyone had a roast this is this is the point to make also that, that we have to look at who was actually in the city so as we've said women children uh, not, maybe, not many women, even towards the end of the uh, the Second World War, were drafted into fighting uh, in Germany. There was some last ditch uh, things, but basically that it was it, it was a male occupation. Uh, so we had women, young children, and disabled uh, servicemen returning from the war, populating most of um, most of Berlin at this time. Any able-bodied male from the age of 13 upwards uh, had usually been moved to, to um, moved to Russia by now uh, to, to start rebuilding. Uh, Moscow is an interesting place for those of you that have been or, or might be familiar with it. The, the Stalin wedding cakes, as they're called, from the 1950s, uh, the Moscow State University, which is one, you know, big block tower in the middle with... Uh, with four imposing towers around it most of those were built with german slave labor and quite a number of them were built with material that was taken from berlin and various other big buildings to make a statement that you know they are building a communist world on top of a, a dead fascist one so so some quite interesting archaeology there if you want um so the city was full of people who were very vulnerable that's the bottom line with it of course, privations were such that uh, that looting was becoming a bit of an issue. So people would, you know, would would feed their family any way they possibly could, uh, and that led to obviously a massive black market and uh, some rather unsavoury practices going on in 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 this city uh, and others. So uh, so people were very vulnerable, and this is, these are some of the don't forget these are some of the situations that the, that, that the communists want to place people in so that they will come over to them in the end well um ernst reuter who had just become the mayor of uh of berlin 
um, but probably not not on uh, not holding much sway in the Soviet area. Decided that you know we were that they were going to stand. And interestingly, uh, Reuter was a communist before the war. Um, he but mellowed somewhat. Um, and spent he spent time in a concentration camp before uh, leaving and, and and taking up residence in Turkey just before the second world outbreak of the second world war proper uh, came back to the city in in 1945 and worked his way up through uh, various government uh, western government blocks uh, offices until he became as i say he became the mayor uh, and reuter is is a is a famous name now uh, in so much as he he called a rally, which uh, outside the burnt out Reichstag, as you can see there, and, and don't forget the Reichstag did not become the seat of Parliament again until 1992, I think it was. Uh, so quite, it stayed in that state for quite a long time. Um, he held a rally and and spoke to Berliners, suggesting that um, that that we should stand up against this tyranny, this this fact that um, that you know that the Soviets are not what they seem. Uh, and he had good reason to say so. Uh, and that also, he, that, that if they placed a, a big enough, loud enough plea, people would forget what had happened in the past and help them. So here we are uh, with General Lucius Clay on the on on the Allies' side, saying that we shouldn't believe in Berlin. We should make a statement now because it cl it's clear that the Soviets want to move further into Europe. So if we make a statement over Berlin, we could we could actually stop them doing that or make them think twice and the population also saying please world will you save us we will stay on we will stay committed to you but you must be committed to us and so in short order the airlift starts now the airlift starts as it did do um from from eight bases uh, across the western zones um or the buy zone i should say um into the three airports uh, that, well, two airports as it stands at the moment at, at this time in uh, in Berlin itself. Um, quite a few names for them. Operation Vittles, with the American side. Well, Vittles speaks for itself, doesn't it? It's you know uh, moving food backwards and forwards. The America, uh, the British though, had a slightly different uh, approach to this. Uh, eventually, we be, our operation became Operation Plainfair. But it didn't start out like that. Originally, it was called Operation Carter Jonas for some bizarre reason, until the Soviet press picked that up. Um, and when they picked it up, they they reminded uh, people that <laughs> that Carter Jonas at the time was a big British removal firm, and it looked like the British were actually moving out of Berlin. So they changed the name of the uh, from Carter Jonas to Operation Nicker. Well, of course, you, you give troops any uh, any opportunity and they'll take a mile. So all the Jeeps and Land Rovers and everything else had ladies bloomers tied on the uh, on the uh, on the aerials and things like that. So actually, in the end, the government got in got in control of the naming. And and so the British operation became known as Operation Plainfair, not Operation Nicker. Although it's lost a bit of its uh, it, its razzmatazz, hasn't it, at that point. So Plainfair and Vittles uh, were the two operations from from our good selves and the Americans. So where did they fly? Well, they flew into Tempelhof, which is right in the center of uh, Berlin. Tempelhof has just, just closed actually as a flying field, I believe. Uh, but, the, but the impressive structure that was built by the Third Reich uh, early in the 1930s or started early in the 1930s has been retained. Um, here you can see, um, you can see a bit of the devastation of the city as well, and some of the pockmarking on the grass grass airfield itself. So, Tempelhof was operated by the Americans pretty much as a as a, a fly in and fly out basic field, and then was taken in by Operation Vittles. Gatow was in the uh, in the British sectors. RAF Gatow, as it became. Uh, was a Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe base beforehand. Uh, Gatow was retained in operation until 1992, I believe, 1993, uh, as our link with Berlin. 
uh, but uh, it became the focus for the British and others uh, and the civilian flying that, that flew into the into the city. So that's two airfields that were actually there at the time with potmarks needed filling and some infrastructure uh, needing repairing. But but basically with an airfield, what an air with aircraft, what you have to remember is as long as the landing surface is okay for them to land on, and they've got enough infrastructure, fueling, uh, basic servicing, turnarounds, that sort of thing, uh, to to actually deal with them when they're on the ground. That's all they need. So archaeologically, again, they're a bit bit of a rare beast if they're only flying into something and leave, and leaving again. They're not actually leaving much evidence. Um, anyway, so that Temple Hof and Gatow were already extant, but the French had a cunning idea as well. Um, the French said, "We have two uh, we have two areas uh, that that form our sector up in the north." We'll build an airfield. So what they did was they first of all they went slightly over the Soviet border and demolished a load of listing stations, which which didn't please the Russians uh, <laughs> very much. Uh, but the, but there was no a action afterwards, so it, it it remains to be seen how that was really taken. Uh, but the point to make here is at the point when we say moved over the border, the border was no more than a little fence line or nothing at all. Or a white lane, a white painted line in the street. Don't forget the Berlin Wall didn't appear until 1961. So people could freely move around the city. And this is one of the things that the Soviets did. They, they were interested in encouraging people to register for rations in their zone. So there would be no point in putting big barriers up all over. So, so at that time, uh, it was it it was hoped that people would move into the into the eastern zones and register for rations. Uh, and what they were doing at the time, I should say, was they were stripping uh, food from all other countries that they were in, uh, had taken and were occupying to pump into Berlin to make it look like their area was absolutely fantastic and overburdened with with food, you know, whereas why would you want to live, you know, on, on, on this meagre ration that you're going to get staying with the Western area? Anyway, that meagre ration was complemented somewhat because the French built in three months a new airfield at Tegel using um, using rubble from the city and machinery that was that, that was cobbled together. Uh, two road rollers, for instance, were taken out of a steam museum. Uh, they were both war damaged, but uh, but they were but they managed to get them up and running. Um, and the, the the Tegel is one of the stories of. Um, of, of the perseverance and tenacity of people uh, when they're when they have uh, st in strife. So, uh, so what we have here are mostly women and children building this, yeah, which is quite phenomenal. Now that we've got the American bulldozer down in the bottom left-hand corner there, um, as you can see, that's quite a big piece of kit, isn't it? Probably weighs quite a lot, yeah, and it wouldn't fit into any aeroplane at the time. Um, so there's a problem. Uh, how do we get these pieces of kit that are definitely needed into Frankfurt, uh, from Frankfurt, because that's where that one, these ones came from, into the um, in, into Berlin via air? Couldn't take them by road. So <laughs> the engineers came up with a brilliant plan, which was they would unbolt and take bits off where possible. Where bits were too big or too heavy, they simply cut them up, shipped them over in um, in component parts, and then welded them back together again. So quite quite an amazing amount of equipment was taken over in in um, in no more than six foot lengths, basically, uh, into into the city and welded together to produce all sorts of things. You know, like that that bulldozer you see there, and many other uh, pieces of equipment that that because the Soviets had, had cleaned the city of all such things and taken it back to uh, well, taken it back to the Soviet Union. They didn't use it afterwards they left it most of it rotting in goods yards and things like that it was just a you know that just a statement i think more than anything else yeah so the uh americans cut up machinery and moved it into the uh in, in, into berlin in six foot lengths and i should say they also built a power station that way the power station didn't come online until 19 end of 1949 early 1950 but it was built taking six foot lengths of material in you know, so that in itself is quite a quite a feat as well. Once a chap called William Tunner had got hold of the airlift, um, 
and, and shaken out the bits, it worked like a sewing machine or ran like a sewing machine. As you can see here with the different arrows, we've got the different uh, different airfields producing uh, producing a, a pack of aircraft or or a, a flight, if you like. Those aircraft will fly in uh, to a given airfield and then fly out via a different route back to their home base. By doing this. Um, Th th there was a cyclic motion through the city and back to back to uh, western bases and then back to the city and then back again um, and this meant that aircraft could be as the film said landing on, and this was only on occasion but it is it is still the case landing at one of those airfields every 90 seconds now that's an incredible turnover that's almost like modern movements at an airfield nowadays isn't it really really is it's it's incredible but tunner william tunner i should say was uh, was the architect of over the hump which some of you might be familiar with which is um uh the towards the end of the pacific war uh the communists were tr <laughs> and and slightly later the communists of course were trying to take over in china with mao and his 10,000 mile march which was probably more like 2,000 miles but we won't quibble over that um tunner and the Americans were trying to prop up Chen Chiang Kai-shek's government pro-leaning to the Americans and over the hump was flying military equipment uh, from India and places like that over the Himalayas and into China and so so Tunna was logistically was had a brilliant logistical mind and that and was able to 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 apply that to to this process making it such a success also, this provides the first real testing of, uh, of, of a substantial air traffic control system, which was in its infancy at the time. So, so the Berlin airlift actually ramps up how many aircraft can be controlled in the air at any one time, which, which I, think, I always think is interesting. Yeah, this is a map of Berlin, our sector. What you can see in the, bot in the bottom left is Lake Harvel. Lake Harvel was a big expanse of water. Um, in our arsenal, in our air arsenal, of course, next message, uh, next one, please, Maddie. Um, we had these, which featured in that film, as you can see, the good old flying boat, uh, the short Sunderland, a fantastic beast. Um, I'm not sure it looks like it should fly, but uh, it certainly did. Um, and it was uh, mostly the preserve of coastal command, as some of you will be familiar with. Um, and it also harks back to the earlier empire days, doesn't it, of flying, uh, flying around the world in flying boats with, you know, and slightly later as well, flying boats didn't really disappear until the 50s, 60s, um, when, when it was not seen as a viable proposition anymore. So, at the beginning of the lift, so for the first four months up until December, flying boats were in operation um all sorts of things moved in and out with these uh, of course there's some issues with them you can't well you can bring them on land but when you're landing uh at, when you were landing at harvel you couldn't do that so basically uh everything had to be taken by boat uh and tried not to drop in the water uh if you talk to i've talked to quite a few engineers who worked on these things over the years um, and they all said the same thing, whatever you do, make sure you tie your spanners to your wrists with pieces of string, because if you're working on the engine and you drop your spanner, that's the end of the spanner. So um, so there were a few restrictions with, with what you could and couldn't do in, in, in this. But basically, um, the, what, the, what the Sunderlands did was they brought in um, material that would damage other aircraft. Uh, predominantly, believe it or not, salt. Now these aircraft are anodized. It's a technique to stop the salt water that they operate in corroding the, the structure of the aircraft or the fuser of the aircraft. Um, so you anodize it. It's a, it's a process that's that's undertaken. Well, that means that, and all the cables as well for the for the uh, for operating all the flank controls are up in the roof of these things. So there was going to be no way salt could get into the um, into it into the aircraft workings itself but what it did need the city was at least six tons of salt a day for bread making and various other things of course salt is a, is an important ingredient in food isn't it and it is needed by the body so um 
So these flew, this flew, this uh, Sunderland's flew, that sort of thing. At the time of um, at the time of the airlift, 201 and 206 squadrons were the only squadrons still operating flying boats in the Royal Air Force and in Britain. Um, and 206 was about to be disbanded uh, be just before the airlift. So what happens is these aircraft are then used on this particular on, on this particular operation before they're wound down. And I think they operate till about 1950 in the end before before we don't see any more. There is a fantastic example of a Sunderland in the um, Hendon Museum, if anyone goes to London, to the Royal Air Force Museum. That she's such a massive thing. It's incredible. You'd think it wouldn't get off the ground, never mind off water. Thank you for watching part three of this Heritage Talk on the Berlin Airlift 10 tons for Tempelhof.